chapter 7, cooperation of ministers and laymen unitedly enter the field of service. Let ministers and lay members go forth into the ripening fields. They will find their harvest wherever they proclaim the forgotten truths of the Bible. They will find those who will accept the truth and who will devote their lives to winning souls to Christ. It is not the Lord's purpose that ministers should be left to do the greatest part of the work of sowing the seeds of truth. Men who are not called to the ministry are to be encouraged to labor for the Master according to their several ability. Hundreds of men and women now idle could do acceptable service. By carrying the truth into the homes of their friends and neighbors, they could do a great work for the Master. God has given His ministers the message of truth to proclaim. This the churches are to receive, and in every possible way to communicate, catching the first rays of light and diffusing them. The people must lift where the minister lifts, thus seconding his efforts and helping him bear his burdens, and then he will not be overworked and become discouraged. There is no influence that can be brought to bear on a church that will be enduring unless the people shall move intelligently from principle to do all they can to forward the work. A convincing combination. The world will be convinced, not by what the pulpit teaches, but by what the church lives. The ministry in the desk announces the theory of the gospel. The practical piety of the church demonstrates its power. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. Preaching is a small part of the work to be done for the salvation of souls. God's Spirit convicts sinners of the truth and He places them in the arms of the church. The ministers may do their part, but they can never perform the work that the church should do. The dissemination of the truth of God is not confined to a few ordained ministers. The truth is to be scattered by all who claim to be disciples of Christ. It must be sown beside all waters. Ministers may preach pleasing and forcible discourses, and much labor may be put forth to build up and make the church prosperous, but unless its individual members shall act their part as servants of Jesus Christ, the church will ever be in darkness and without strength. Hard and dark as the world is, the influence of a really consistent example will be a power for good. A fatal mistake. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of soul saving depends alone upon the ministry. The humble, consecrated believer upon whom the master of the vineyard places a burden for souls is to be given encouragement by the men upon whom the Lord has laid larger responsibilities. Those who stand as leaders in the church of God are to realize that the Savior's commission is given to all who believe in His name. God will send forth into His vineyard many who have not been dedicated to the ministry by the laying on of hands. The idea that the minister must carry all the burdens and do all the work is a great mistake. Overworked and broken down, he may go into the grave when had the burden been shared as the Lord designed, he might have lived. That the burden may be distributed and education must be given to the church by those who can teach the workers to follow Christ and to work as he worked. The minister should not feel that it is his duty to do all the talking and all the laboring and all the praying. He should educate helpers in every church. Let different ones take turns in leading the meetings and in giving Bible readings. In so doing, they will be calling into use the talents which God has given them and at the same time be receiving a training as workers. Ministers should not do the work which belongs to the church, thus wearying themselves and preventing others from performing their duty. They should teach the members how to labor in the church and in the community. When an effort is made to present our faith to unbelievers, the members of the church too often stand back as if they were not an interested party and let all the burden rest upon the minister. For this reason, the labor of our most able ministers have been at times productive of little good. The minister's duty. The best help that ministers can give the members of our churches is not sermonizing, but planning work for them. 
give each one something to do for others. Help all to see that as receivers of the grace of Christ, they are under obligation to work for Him. And let all be taught how to work. Especially should those who are newly come to the faith be educated to become laborers together with God. Ministers preach the truths that will lead to personal labor for those who are out of Christ. Encourage personal effort in every possible way. Let ministers teach church members that in order to grow in spirituality, they must carry the burden that the Lord has laid upon them, the burden of leading souls into the truth. Those who are not fulfilling their responsibilities should be visited, prayed with, labored for. Do not lead people to depend upon you as ministers. Teach them, rather, that they are to use their talents in giving the truth to those around them. In thus working, they will have the cooperation of heavenly angels and will obtain an experience that will increase their faith and give them a strong hold on God. In laboring where there are already some in the faith, the minister should at first seek not so much to convert unbelievers as to train the church members for acceptable cooperation. Let him labor for them individually, endeavoring to arouse them to seek for a deeper experience themselves and to work for others. When they are prepared to sustain the minister by their prayers and labors, greater success will attend his efforts. In some respect, the pastor occupies a position similar to that of the formation of a gang of laboring men or the captain of a ship's crew. They are expected to see that the men over whom they are set do the work assigned to them correctly and promptly, and only in case of emergency are they to execute in detail. The owner of a large mill once found his superintendent in a wheel pit making some simple repairs while a half dozen workmen in that line were standing by idly looking on. The proprietor, after learning the facts so as to be sure that no injustice was done, called the foreman to his office and handed him his discharge with full pay. In surprise, the foreman asked for an explanation. It was given in these words, I employed you to keep six men at work. I found the six idle and you doing the work of but one. Your work could have been done just as well by any one of the six. I cannot afford to pay the wages of seven for you to teach the six how to be idle. This incident may be applicable in some cases and in others not. But many pastors fail in not knowing how or in not trying to get the full membership of the church actively engaged in the various departments of church work. If pastors would give more attention to getting and keeping their flock actively engaged at work, they would accomplish more good, have more time for study and religious visiting, and also avoid many causes of friction. A good example... The Apostle Paul felt that he was to a large extent responsible for the spiritual welfare of those converted under his labors. His desire for them was that they might increase in a knowledge of the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he had sent. Often in his ministry he would meet with little companies of men and women who loved Jesus and bow with them in prayer, asking God to teach them how to maintain a living connection with him. Often he took counsel with them as to the best methods of giving to others a light of gospel truth. And often when separated from those for whom he had thus labored, he pleaded with God to keep them from evil and to help them to be earnest, active missionaries.